<laughs> okay. We're now live streaming. Is wow. Very... Is it now live? Yeah, yeah, live. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, so firstly, I want to begin by wel welcoming Bufu and everyone listening. It's been very nice, very nice for you to join us. And before we start the conversation, we just wanted to share some information about ourselves. So my name is Nisi Marsh, and I'm the co-founder, co-director of Feminist Culture House. And my pronouns, she and her, and I'm wearing today a long sleeved turquoise top with a blue top underneath yeah oh and some jewelry shiny <laughs> um hi also welcome on my behalf i'm orlan oftenen i'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of feminist culture house um i'm wearing a black t-shirt with some white text uh i'm a white person with short kind of turquoisey sea foam color hair Thank you, Katie. Um, um, black uh, ring glasses and one gold earring and a gold necklace. Did I say my pronouns? My pronouns are there. I don't know if I said it. No. There we go. Yes. Maybe Sonia next. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sonia. I use any pronouns except it. Um, and I'm wearing a striped maroon shirt. I am East Asian, I'm Korean, and I have short green and black hair with a little bit of bangs. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Hi, Thanks. my name is, oh, hi. Yeah. Sorry, I just said thank you. <laughs> Um, my name is Ageta Fessa. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a black femme who's wearing, I have a little gold necklace. I have like a, some, a bustier trying to look cute because it's fully 7 a.m. where I am and I'm trying to look awake. I got some, a sad attempt at gold eyeliner, but you know, we're trying, we are here, we're present. Um, yes, so that's what's happening here. Hello, good morning and <laughs> afternoon and evening. <laughs> Thank you. So before we begin the discussion, we just wanted to have a short introduction. So we're Feminist Culture House, an intersectional feminist organization that works with and for underrepresented artists. And we're based in Helsinki, Finland. And we're having this conversation with Sonia and Sergei as part of an exhibition, uh, What's the Use of Intersectionality? that we curated for Stoa Culture House, uh, sorry, Culture Center in Helsinki as well. Uh, and at this exhibition, there's a set of new commissioned artworks in the windows and courtyard um, and flag balls of Stoa. And on top of that, we're having these conversations. <clears throat> so we're speaking with Bufu today, who are a project-based collective interested in solidarity amongst co-creating with you experimental models of organizing and making a practice of practicing lib liberation and love. So we're speaking with Sonia first, who is a Korean non-binary third culture kid. Uh, they were born in Hong Kong from Korean parents and um, lived in South Korea, the Philippines, Canada and the US. Uh, growing up in different contexts uh, has given them first-hand experiences in understanding the complexity of globalization, capitalism, colonialism, and how the macro affects the micro levels of human ontology and relationships. And they are particularly interested in solidarity work amongst uh, QT BIPOC folks across the borders. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> Sergei's work looked um, to wage intimacy in a world growing deeply disconnected through performance, community organizing, multimedia, uh, journalism, curation, and VR. She conjures building pathways from where we've been to where we could go. Collaboratively, she's a co founder of Bias For Us, a project based collective interested in solidarity, like Nisia said. 
And then this conversation will be visually documented by the artist Apila uh, Pepita. And you can find their work later on on our website and also social media channels. We'll be sharing them there. So maybe now is a good time to have the first questions. So the first one is for Bufu to tell us about the work that you do and when did the collective begin? Okay, great. Sonia, do you want me to start or do you want to start? I'm, I'm okay with whatever. <laughs> How about you start because I'm just adjusting to being on earth and then I'll jump in. <laughs> Okay, um, so so Bufu started in 2015, I think around September. It was during the winter. Um, basically, the five of us met at the new school, um, and we were all kind of doing different things, but there were certain overlaps, like Sige was the head of Students of the African Diaspora, Catherine and June, who's not with us anymore, um, they were part of API Collective. I was doing um, prison divestment work. And Jasmine, I would see her at like the Students of Color meetups. And so we kind of like met each other at different points. I personally met Sege, um in this class called Resistance which was about political resistance. And she was the only person in the room that I felt like I could really fuck with heavy. Um, <laughs> everyone else was just, you know, not there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we all had like different points in our friendship um, and relationships that grew in different mm -hmm. ways. And there were some overlaps and, um, I think I think we started when um, it was after like this film screening that Sege, June and Catherine organized called um, Mountains That Take Wing, which was a conversation between Yuri Kochiyama and Angela Davis. Okay. Um, and it's about their relationship. And they held a screening and a talk after and. Um, and the talk part was really challenging, I think, to like navigate. I think we didn't really know how to talk to each other as like folks of color in the room. Like it was mostly like black and Asian bodies in the room. And I think we just really wanted to find a language for us outside of white supremacy to kind of like know how to like talk to each other and how to you know, really communicate and how to hold space for each other. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I'll, ju I'll jump in, but yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so, that was so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was great. And so that's kind of how we all came together and it kind of, it launched um, our first project. So before we were formally recognizing ourselves as collective, we started this collaborative documentary project um, which has lived in different installation forms and is, you can check out, I think 45 minutes of it on our website. And it was a project that was seeking to archive and also archive these like, these interconnected relationships between black and Asian folks globally. So we traveled to uh, Ethiopia, looking at like different um, like, like factories and like Chinese influence on the continent as a whole. We went to Jamaica and like try to tune into the histories of um, Chinese Jamaicans and Indian folks and kind of looking at the wave of immigration that happened there post slavery with indentured servitude. We went to India to um, uh, learn about the Dalit folks and Dalit Panthers and the interconnected movements of like Black and Dalit um, liberation. We were in Japan and Korea. Those were the first places we went to looking at um, kind of like this conversation of cultural appropriation versus cultural exchange and looking at the music industry and the fashion industry. We were in China um, where we got to spend time uh, in Guangzhou, which, ha which houses the largest population of Black folks um, in Asia. 
and um, got to learn about the markets that are connected to the continent there, as well as the learning from like the Nashi folks um, who are uh, an ethnic minority in China whose name translates to black people and just tried to archive all. And then we were also in the States, of course, we were in New York and LA, we were there for the, the 25 year anniversary of the LA riots. And just trying to um, kind of paint a tapestry of relationship and um, and kind of uh, deepen an understanding of like where do the disconnects happen and often like how we are weaponized against each other in service of white supremacy. And so this was kind of the initial project that brought us together. And from there, we were given op an opportunity to, to exhibit our work in process in 2016 mm -hmm. in this like strange dilapidated warehouse that was in Brooklyn that a bunch of artists that we really respect, like really incredible artists, De um, Devin Kenny was in this warehouse with us, uh, Rafia Santana was in this warehouse with us, a whole bunch of folks. Um, and they, they were kind of squatting out this space and wanted the, this large kind of massive warehouse to be exhibitions. It was a whole mess. <laughs> not live not like a space that people should have been in but um you know through the power of community we activated it and you know deep cleaned it and turned it into this um kind of like a community space looking at like how can we we were thinking first initially like how can we engage our documentary project like how do we make a living archive like how do we embody this piece and not just have people kind of consume the work, but like really live in it. Mm -hmm. And so because we had organizing and programming experience before this, we brought that to the work we brought in our community and came up with like, like I think it was at the end, it was like 120 programs that were all based around this idea of black and Asian futurity. And that mm -hmm. kind of cracked open a new way of us embodying our work and led to like these ev these yearly projects of collaborative programming. But it really came from like feeling like, yeah, trying to embody a call and activate community and whatever resources we had. So that was like the first initial project. And every year since we've done like really massive community activations across New York City under different themes. So the next year we did um, programs across New York City in every single borough in museums, bars, backyards, rooftops, a whole bunch of alternative spaces, gardens in every single borough looking at collectives and collective organizing. Collaboration with a bunch of different spaces. Um, and the year after that, I think we did a residency. We were at iBeam Art Technology. And while we were there, we saw just like uh, a lack of people of, of um, a lack of access to the resources that were really abundant at the mm -hmm. at the residency. And we invited 16 artists to come um, and be residents within our residency under the theme of solidarity is possible, but not inevitable. And then the year after that, we did a school partnering with schools across uh, New York alternative schools. Okay. And we created our own school. I think we had like 72 classes, mostly in person and then like a handful online. Um, and then this past year, we did uh, what we called Cloud Nine, where we had 86 online programs um, with community. But it was kind of like a free for all. Like the theme was kind of like, let's survive and like skills, but also just like people good. Like, <laughs> what do you want to do? You want to live stream your cat? Let's do a program. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that no one did that but it was on the thing we could have applied with that there was an option so there was power though though <laughs> there was someone someone did teach us how to make sourdough i didn't oh, learn nice. but i was there um but yeah so this is kind of like the a really like a very like schematic of the many, 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 many projects we've mm. engaged in as a collective. It sounds like you're like a thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> You've done so much. It's amazing and really 
so interesting and thanks for like telling us more because obviously we've like read your website but it's just you hearing it is so much easier to understand like the multifaceted things that you've done definitely but how have you kind of I think for us sometimes when we're in the collective how have you found the people that you want to have partnerships with like how did you find this warehouse space were you also working with artists already and then they were just okay this person this person like networking yeah I think I think for us like you know it is like a thousand people it takes to do every single project like I think if you go to our website there's like maybe maybe a couple hundred names and like groups that we've worked with but it's just not encompassing of everyone who's done stuff with us Mm -hmm. and I think part like part of what happens is like when we're not in because we do like it's like one massive project and so that project you know it's like maybe there's like four or five months of buildup but there is like a good six months where we're not doing work as a collective. Yeah. And I think that is really useful to us because we all have our own individual lives where we're like, you know, we, we hold kind of a similar political ideals. And like, I think we have personal relationships. Like I think it's been really important to us to be really intentional about the relationships that we have as a like that is as a collective like the work that we do it's really rare that we kind of work with someone we've never met before Mm -hmm. um and if we do work with someone we've never met we do like trainings so like for like the wi-fi school where we had people who were teaching that we some people we didn't have relationships to we thought really critically around like how can we create trainings for teachers packets of like how they can facilitate and then we also like had we hired we paid people to be care workers in the classes okay so that just in case the person was, and we also made sure one of us as a collective member were to support facilitation if things went left yeah um but for the most part I think you know I think it's like moving with relationships that we feel rooted in is like really important And I think it's part of the work is like making sure that like when we're not in collective mode, we're, we're supporting other people's work and we're really present in our, in our community and like deepening those relationships. Otherwise it's, it can get really, it can get dangerous because you don't have the context to really hold and support people. So that's kind of how we, I think it feels very organic. Like, I don't think we feel forced to like we need to collaborate with so-and-so because they're amazing we're like well we don't really know them and that's okay and if we want to we can develop a relationship with them and see what's up yeah it feels pretty organic I think nice yeah I think also naming things as not being transactional and more relational and um, I feel like Segei and Catherine, they've been, they are like the spearheaders of like programming and things. And so they're really good at that. I'm, I'm very like socially awkward, <laughs> but um, I feel like, yeah, I think it takes a lot of like, um, yeah, just relationship building. That's really genuine. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But we all have like very, I think we all, first off, you're not that awkward, Sonia. Anyhow, but also we all have very like different, um, different skills that we bring to the work too. Like we're about to have this, this billboard go up in LA in Atlanta. And, you know, Sonia hand painted these incredible white flowers that are going to be on it. And it's like, you know, like, there's yeah. no amount of relationshiping for me that's going to have me hand painting flowers on a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> so is this going to be a new project? This billboard project? Yeah, this is just a, a commission from the Four Freedoms Project. Okay. They're having, they, they've been doing billboards across different spaces. And so we were invited to contribute a billboard. Nice. But I just was saying that because I was like, Sonia, listen. for you like how because we've now this whole exhibition has been um 
going around the theme of intersectionality and and it's obviously like really important to our work but we would be really interested to know how does that guide your programming and your work in general mm. yeah i feel um uh can i just jump in yeah um yes. okay actually the word intersectionality um not just thinking about kimberly crenshaw but um really makes me think of this quote i think it's from mariam kaba but she said that um we always need to think about who's not in the room and i think that that's something that we've always strived for except like we are also limited in terms of like who we are as people and i think just like being okay with that but also like that striving is really important because I think there's a lot of like expectations from especially for femmes of color to be perfect and do everything perfectly and do like xyz like with no resources mm -hmm. and I think that's just unfair because it's like people don't really say that for like you know mask folks or like white people and etc and it's just like yeah like but it's like we're always striving to think about like who's not in the room who needs to be in the room who do we need to talk to who do we need to build those relationships with and um thinking about that not just in a timely sense but in terms of like a longevity um and I think we all we always have these internal conversations amongst ourselves in terms of like what's missing, like what went right, what went wrong, you know, and kind of having that reflective process, I think has been really important um, for our foundation as a collective. Yeah. That was great. I don't know, that's, yep. <laughs> um, is it something that you work with when you're programming or is the programming also just like coming from your collaborations and like you said like working quite um organically yeah I mean I think I mean I think I really co like I said I really co-sign what Sonia said I think it is I think it's deeply considered in every single part of our work mm -hmm. um but I think yeah I think also like I really appreciate also certainly talking to the limitations of our, our, our us as well like I think we do a pretty good job of of trying to consider you know how both how all of our identities come into the room and also like holding space and and making sure that you know those relationships are reflected and also I think if you think I mean, beyond that, I think if you look at our programming, I think you can see oh. that are shared, the, the embodiments of it too. Like I think it's been really, um, as I'm sorry, am I cutting out? No, I'm not. Yes, a little bit. <laughs> um, it's been really important for us to think, am I, okay. All right, well, I'm just gonna power through and hope the internet <laughs> yes. returns. Um, but I think it's been really important. Yeah, okay. Um, I think it's been really important to us to also think about, um, I'm just keeping going, that <laughs> about um, different embodiments of, of, of how programming happens. Like, I think it's really important. Like, if you look at all of our work, like, it's very rare that we'll just have like lecture, 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 lecture. Yeah. It'll be often that, like we have like workshop, lecture, panel, party um you know performance um you know whatever breaking bread some kind of a dinner thing screening like um like many different ways to kind of come into embodiment and come into mm -hmm. like the community around what's happening um and and yeah i think that's really in intentional in, in the process as well but mm -hmm. but yeah i think it's i think it's a it's a foundational principle that I think we're lucky enough to really embody pretty deeply. And it doesn't feel like a forced thing that's in the room. It feels like it's just, you know, as, as queer folks of color, it's central to how we consider how we make and just are. Mm -hmm. 
I think my next question has been, um, we know you've been like featured in many publications. So I wanted to ask you, has this been like, have publications found you as you've been working or have you been reaching out to different uh, magazines and uh, newspapers to talk about the work you do in order to like publicize and spread and become a bigger community? So how, have this, how has this been about? Yeah, we don't reach out to publications. We resent them. <laughs> we do not reach out to people. Unless I mean, it's like our homies or something. Unless it's our friends, we almost never say yes to publications. I mean, it's. I mean, we have some things written about us, and we've done some shoots, but we almost full stopped. I think in 2017, 2018, mm. maybe. We like we actually we put out a video. I don't know if you can find it somewhere on YouTube or something, and I think it's called "Win a Date with Bufu." <laughs> and <laughs> we were so we were so angry at how people were portraying us because I think it was like a runaway train in 2015, 2016, 2017 where like it was kind of like the beginning of this new wave of just like consume QTPOT bodies and just yeah. spit them out through machines like Vice and all these different things yeah. and and all of their 20 different magazines that live under that name. And I think we didn't understand what consumption and visibility really meant at that point. So we would like, we were hesitant, but we we're like, okay, like, I guess we'll do this photo shoot. Okay, I guess we'll talk to this. Okay, I guess we'll be, an ad. we were an ad for Vice at one point. Okay. I think in 2016, we were a full oh. ad for Vice Land, on, and it was a nightmare. It was the worst <laughs> thing that's ever happened terrible, to us. Terrible. It was a nightmare. And I think after that, we were so frustrated. We had, to, also, if you look at the YouTube comments, like people were writing like death threats to us. It was like really not cute. Yeah. It's, and it's still up on Vice. It's terrible. And they didn't moderate any of it. And I think nope. after that, we were so angry. And also people would just, misrepresent us they would call us anything they felt like teen feminist collective we're none of us are teenagers another time it was like poc garage party throwing crew or just like <laughs> just whatever it is. i wish i was kidding that is online like <laughs> people like literally called us anything they could come up with and so you know really insulting once i remember we saw an article it was like the hottest nyc collective you've never heard of and i was like this is insulting who are you yeah. why are you <laughs> what who is this and we, it was like unsolicited by us and so we did this video and the video is us looking and also they just didn't care about the work at all the content mm -hmm. was never about what we were doing it was always about our aesthetics and so the video is us looking hot being on a roof and the whole thing is like, pay us to go on a date because no one cares about our work. And we named every single magazine that had written about us. And we were like, Fader Magazine, this and blah, da, 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 da. And they, basically they can all go fuck themselves because all they want to do is think that we're cute. And so it's this big fake ad and you can look at it. And then no one reached out for like six months. <laughs> no one was like, we were like, People were like, don't cover them. They hate people. <laughs> and and it was great. It was lovely because it, you know, wasn't benefiting anyone. Yeah. And then I think since then we've been really intentional about who we agree to be interviewed by or who we agree to like be, you know, published by or, you know, if we can control it. Cause sometimes people just write things often. We find yeah. out later, like that people had written things and I think for us we're really pretty blessed to all be on a similar page around like we don't need a lot of publicity you know like the work is going to continue to happen like we are going to figure out how to get resources for it like there's there's a a real like there's a there was a show at New Museum that I really appreciated and there's a book that goes along with it called Visibility is a Trap and it's talking about like queerness and transness and visibility. And I think that phrase is, is true. You know, I think there's, there's, there's something really beautiful to being able to share at such a scale what mm. we're thinking about, but also like 
like honestly like our work is really rooted in both our identities and our locations and like who we're working with so it's not always intended for people like at 10,000, 100,000. And there's something that gets lost in the consumption of an intimate project that's like now being consumed by people who are not in that context. Mm. So I think we think really strategically around what scale means to us and trying to move as honestly and organically as possible. Yeah, because honestly, like the people who read vice or watch vice or whatever like they're not our audience like we don't need them (laughs) and yeah like visibility is a trap because it just makes us more susceptible to surveillance yeah so like (laughs) i think i think i'm more interested in like illegibility of things and more leaning into like speaking to our communities like QT BIPOC communities that we've been working with like only and um being really intentional about that yeah yeah um and like when we were preparing for these conversations we talked with um some some of the other collectives as well and this question came up of like um and I think it relates to what you just said now that like um if you've ever felt like you have to also think about if you're going to be presented as like the face of mm. um, whatever you're doing or like um, any kind of label that people are putting on you. And, and has that been part of these um, conversations when you've had to strategize about media? Mm. I mean, I think not really and I think part of that is because I think I'm not going to personally change someone's mind around anti-blackness right Mm -hmm. if they came to see my body and myself from an anti-black lens it's not going to shift for them and I'm not I'm not actually invested in shifting that for them I'm invested in speaking really honestly about myself I mean just speaking very personally and my experience and who I am to people who are ready to hear it. And often that is like folks who are either like, who share my identity, QTPOC folks, people who identify as allies. But if they're kind of like not in that place, I feel absolutely no interest in trying to present myself in such a way that is like, not not in my integrity. Like I'm not necessarily, like even now as we're speaking about the work, like we're speaking super like, I think in, you have to be, have an ear to, be interested in this internal dialogue. Like there's nothing about this that is like, I'm trying to educate someone who's never heard of QTPOC people before. Like, it's just not gonna happen. And I think that there's a real dangerous, there's a dangerous place there. I mean, it's, there's important work there, but I think there's there's a dangerous place that can become where like we become the prime, like our life and our work becomes a primary source of like educating people who don't, who aren't invested in transforming themselves. Like it's yeah. just not. So I don't think we think about the people who don't care about us when they're not, because they're not in the room for us. Like, yeah. And if they are in the room, they're not going to hear it anyways. There's nothing to be done there. Like they have all the resource <laughs> and time to figure that shit out. And my work in my life is not to transform them. My work in my life is to like be in like, super in my integrity with people who, who want to love me as a as a being and my identity and like black people in general and want to work with us and and think like when we think about solidarity it's amongst we think we we wrote it like amongst us capital u and Mm -hmm. it was kind of a troll because why do i have to write mission statements but (laughs) but the us is really like if you consider yourself a part of the us then i'm speaking to you if you don't consider yourself a part of what i'm saying with us we're not speaking to you. Don't come over here and don't think that I'm gonna change what I'm doing in order to make you feel comfortable or like understand. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. Right. Yes. And I feel like it has to be like people who deserve that, you know, people who deserve to be in your presence the gay, then <laughs> really, you know like are in a place to like fucking you know 
be around you or be near you. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is just me guessing up my friend because I love <laughs> um, That's but yeah, I think I think in terms of like us representing whatever, I think or I guess like becoming kind of like the spokespeople of things. I think we try to like divest from that a lot in terms of like the whole like celebrity culture of things that get really weird and fucked up and gross. And I think that that's like a huge problem, especially with like social media stuff. Cause it's like, yeah, we're, we're just people and you're a person too. And it's like, we should just be humans together, humaning, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that like, it's so easy to like consume people as like, these images or words online and not realize that there's a human behind all that but then we're just four humans trying to do some stuff that maybe it works for some people maybe it doesn't I mean you know it might make certain people feel very uncomfortable <laughs> but I think you know it's not for them so it's yeah. like you can you know <laughs> take it or leave it yeah definitely I feel like also for us it's been a bit of a sometimes a struggle like people asking us to do things but then we're like we only want to work with underrepresented artists and art workers and then but trying slowly being pulled into another direction and having to constantly go back to like what we want and what we want to focus mm. on I think it's quite difficult but you've done it really well like we found you through cloud nine and then have been like following <laughs> everything since <laughs> and in the past. <laughs> um, I was actually, before I ask you the last question, I wanted to ask like, how have you been finding resources and surviving? So with most of the collective working and then doing this for the six months at a time, because I understand that in the US, the funding isn't yeah. so kind of, there's not much resources for like collectives in the arts field. So how have you like juggled this? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the art, yeah, there's not, the funding is not, I think the same as it is in many places in the world. Definitely it's underfunded in the, the arts at least. But I think for us, it's been, um, just like scamming, we scam a lot. We do a lot of scams um, <laughs> in order to get, to get fun. Um, you know, it's different things. Like I think we, we're very, we're just, you know, we'll hustle for what we want to do. Yeah. Um, at one point, I'll just give some examples because I don't mind. And I think it's good for people to think creatively around how they can finesse funds. And like really just, I'm very pro just, disrespect any institution that you can <laughs> be in relationship to just <laughs> treat them like crap because they are often super crappy so like <laughs> there's no reason to be respectful um to any of them including brands anything you can so uh love people hate institutions that's a good way yeah. to move but um so some of the ways we've scammed money I think for iBeam, for our, for our iDream residency, we had a friend who worked for a brand and want, it was like, hey, we'll sponsor this thing. I'm about to quit my job. You don't have to do anything. I'll just give you the money for the thing. And I was like, great. And so, you know, we took the money and we didn't do anything with the brand. And another time, I think someone invited me for this institution to do a book club for a summer. And then we were like, well, I'll raise you that book club and do an entire school. I'll just do a school oh. instead of that. And so we took the funds that were supposed to be for a book club and we, and I think we took funds where we had been paid for some speaking engagements mm -hmm. and we put it towards the school and paying all the teachers. Um, I think, you know, when we were at new school, that was really easy. We would just be like, we're doing this thing at a conference. We need yeah. thousands of dollars for it. That conference would never happen or we would never <laughs> speak 
if Papa, you know, like that thing would just never happen. No one would check on it. And now we have funding for our warehouse. Okay, or, nice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or like different things like that. And I think, you know, we have also been lucky where like, you know, we've had some foundations. We had a community grant foundation support us. Yeah. Now that we, people think that we are a, a thing and they like give us funding like foundations think we are a legitimate organization we actually but we had a funding meeting recently and there was like this man was like hey like how do you sustain like how are you gonna keep paying for projects and we were like we're not we're just gonna keep getting money and then we're gonna give it away (laughs) like that's the model that's the model and if you don't want to fund it i understand but that's what we're doing (laughs) over here (laughs) <laughs> so so that's been kind of like how that's worked and then for the most part we do we work outside of the collective we have jobs or gigs or yeah. you know like we have other ways that sustain our personal life but Bufu does not sustain us financially <laughs> like maybe we pay like you know like the uber there and like some other things but it's not it's not like a funding resource for our life which is actually really it's hard because you know finances are a thing it has been a blessing I think for the work just that we've been able to really be rooted in integrity and every single person like all of the hundreds of programs we've done at this point every single person has been paid no one works for free for us like we make sure we find funds to pay any person even like on a committee or like we will find some way to pay them yeah and that's really important nice yeah and we have like meetings with folks internally about like you know how much funds there are and you know there has been people who are just like I'm down to like volunteer even though we want to pay them so Mm -hmm. I think it really yeah I we just kind of like work as like this polymorphous kind of blob in terms of funding I think it's really need-based for sure yeah and um it's definitely not like a full-time job um we do it seasonally and we have like our day jobs to sustain us or other funds and things um <laughs> Yeah, I'm working for an artist right now. And, but I think to be honest, like being in America and seeing like how the art funding works there, I think it is a hella privilege because seeing how like the art funding works in Korea, like I think like 90% of it is from the government. And even if you get like the biggest artist prize here, it's probably for like, maybe $10,000, like that's like the highest that you could ever get as an artist. Mm -hmm. And so all the artists here are struggling, have like three jobs. And so I think like working as a full-time artist, I think it it can be a hella privilege in a lot of ways, which is really sad, but it's true. And, you know, it's really not for everyone, (laughs) not for everyone's mental financial health and you know every every kind of health um that connects to that I think yeah we don't have the most sustainable model so I don't particularly recommend it to anyone (laughs) but I think you know I think really like being aligned with our vision and our purpose is really what's the most important thing yeah definitely and so even within this like the not having any state backing either anywhere but being able to pay everyone is really good Mm -hmm. like really amazing work hey i want to say um there's like sound in the background of us because there's two dogs in the room that just decided to be like super active in the middle of this call and also throw up. So um, <laughs> I think you were wondering. Oh. <laughs> we're dogs. Down. <laughs> I'm we sorry. not here at all. <laughs> okay, okay, great. <laughs> Don't worry, but I feel so sad for those dogs. I know, they're okay. They got too excited about this conversation. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Aww. I don't want them to throw up, though. I mean, <laughs> it's I know. I was like, after I said, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> have to figure out what's happening after this call, but I think they're okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe the last question is, um, what are your plans, hopes, and dreams for the rest of 2021? <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you want to go first again or should I I can start <laughs> with my side I think I mean as a collective we have some dreams around some projects that I, I'm really hoping I think we'll know about what the scale will be depending on funds um, that we're trying to get and scam but also you know just trying to get right now um we have some projects where we've been thinking a lot about um, care, like care and grief. Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a project we've been dreaming around um, processing grief with our kind of like our immediate care pods. I think pods have been so important to folks in the pandemic and our care pods have been so central to our survival. And so we were thinking about how we can do our next project as not online as possible. Like how do we do something that feels like um, we're interconnected in our homes together, but separately processing grief. Yeah. And so what that's looking like is like a combination of like a zine and a mailing project and um, kind of like collective meditations at the same time in different places and prompts where we can respond and send each other things and, kind of like doing a network, a care networking th project and then kind of sharing what that experience is like for folks um, yeah. and inviting folks to kind of do that themselves with their pods. So that's something that we're visioning as well as um, we've been working with some folks thinking about grief gardens and just grief. And so that's something that IRL and online we've been, we've been dreaming about and working on. So we just have some stuff around grief and care that feel really rooted in integrity. Um, mm -hmm. And also just trying to find other ways to be in deep intentional connection that don't involve the interwebs as much as possible and involve as much like heart connection, psychic telepathic love connection as possible. So those are some things we're visioning. Ba -da -ba -da -da. Yeah, exactly. That's what we'll be doing for all 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So yes, that's the vision. That's the dream. And I just hope that, you know, and even in the little, the little billboard thing that we were invited to do, just trying to seed as, as much, um, as much like pockets of care and softness and sweetness and love mm -hmm. and just space to be really in touch with what's coming up for us as a globe as a people like the grief that's in the air and just like inviting it in the room and not running from it and finding containers and ways to in in our work to support that is kind of where yeah. we're at yeah and for the billboard specifically we were asked to do something for api history month um, and so we chose to have the billboards in Atlanta and LA specifically because of what happened in Atlanta with the shootings, like the murders of the Asian women, um, and also in LA because there is a huge population of Asian Americans, immigrants there, um, undocumented folks. So, yeah. Nice. Wow. Sounds really beautiful. Yeah. I hope you can find ways to be um, together as much as possible. We're Thank here you. now. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with us. I think it's been really nice and I hope that people listening in have also enjoyed. Yeah, it's so, so inspiring to hear about your work more. Thanks so much for this. 
Thank you. We appreciate it. And then, yeah, say hi to BBs for us. We're big fans. Yes. yes. Oh, <laughs> we'll do. Um, have a really nice, was it morning and evening? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 And hopefully talk to you at some point again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. You. you guys are so lovely. Bye. Bye.